Something sinister is scratching at the edges of my sanity. Something I need to share, to expose to the world. Yet I'm at a loss as to where or how to start. Perhaps at the very beginning of it all is the wisest choice. So please, indulge me for a while. In our quiet little town, there's a twisted rule that clings to us like a specter in the night. A rule we dare not defy. Lest we invite the darkest of fates upon ourselves. Never, under any circumstances, venture into the foreboding nightmare known as the Hissing Trail. This forbidden path slumbers inconspicuously along a seldom-traveled road its entrance perched upon a treacherous incline that snakes its way to a long-abandoned house, perched ominously atop the hill's crest. Abandoned it may be, but the decrepit edifice maintains a sinister hold over us, its looming silhouette casting a malefic shadow across our lives. A sprawling chateau-like manor, three stories tall, festooned with balconies that leer out like the eyes of some monstrous entity, and spears that pierce the heavens with a contemptuous arrogance. Its stark grandeur mocks the shanty homes clustered below as a haunting embodiment of otherworldly luxury. Day and night, its form dominates the skyline, a living monument to terror that no one dares to acknowledge openly just as the trail that commences before its towering iron gates. This house, too, is ensnared by a web of sinister legends. Though its malevolence pales in comparison to the infamy of the trail, the true origins of this haunted myth is gone, devoured by generations of whispered rumors, told by elder kids, sadistic in their desire to seed fear upon the youth, weaving their twisted tales in the schoolyard, tales that mutate and evolve like sinister specters lurking in the shadows. Yet amid the chaos of ever-mutating folklore, a thread remains consistent. Once upon a time, a man and his family inhabited the mansion. Husband, wife, and two children, a self-made magnate, clawing his way up from the pit of poverty to amass a fortune that cast a pall over the village. But the man's lust for riches knew no bounds. Avarice dripped from him like a foul stench, as he perched himself upon a pedestal of his own making, sneering down at those he deemed beneath him. He chased after indulgences with insatiable greed, flaunting his opulence before the hungry eyes of his less fortunate peers. In a place like this, plagued by scarcity, his prosperity granted him domination, and the masses submitted in compliant servitude. However, one day, his empire built upon the bones of others' toil, buckled and crumbled under its own weight. The man who towered above now plummeted beneath, spiraling into the depths of destitution he had once derided. Scorn whispers echoed wherever he tread, pointing fingers with scornful reminders of his fall from grace. Debt collectors ascended the hill like vultures to feast upon his legacy stripping him of every trace of value. Even the most mundane trinkets were seized with glee, a mocking testament to his descent into the abyss. As the final remnants of his ill-gotten wealth were ripped apart, a smoldering fury within him ignited. An inferno of indignation devoured his very soul. Clinging to his delusions of superiority, his pursuit of profits continued, unwavering even as the well ran dry. Backroom deals festered like a sickness, each one driving him deeper into the gapping maw of its own undoing. The abyss yawned wider, an insatiable maw, 
and as he hurled towards his inevitable demise, his sanity wavered like a brittle thread, ready to snap. It was on a dread-laden night, a night when shadows seemed to writhe like living things, and the moon itself cowered behind a shroud of storm-laden clouds, that finally his mind shattered. Fueled by a madness born of desperation, he awakened his unsuspecting family from their uneasy sleep and led them into the woods. Along the path he had commissioned, the purpose of which will forever remain a puzzle. His children trembled with fear, and his wife's voice wailed with desperate pleas. But his ears were deaf to their cries. They were pawns in his disintegrating reality, marionettes guided by hands that had lost their grip on sanity. On that accursed night, the sky itself donned a shroud a tapestry woven from storm clouds that suffocated the heavens. Stars and moon alike were veiled in obscurity, and the village laid cradled in the grasp of an ominous gloom. The wind whispered with malice, cascading down the hill, carrying the echoes of his family's torment to every corner. Villagers stirred uneasily, their blood chilled by the anguished calls that clawed at their sanity, until fueled by a mixture of concern and dread, they climbed the hill, determined to exercise the madness that had seized him. Yet upon their arrival, all they encountered was the abyssal maw of the trail, swallowing the family like a ferocious beast. It was then, as if orchestrated by some malevolent maestro, that the heavens chose to unleash their wrath. The sky convulsed, and its fury descended upon the village. A tempest of cataclysmic proportions unfurled, torrents of rain sweeping in to drench the earth in its tears. The river burgeoned into a raging monster, devouring all it embraced including the crops that had sustained the village. Lightning split the heavens asunder, bolts plummeting like vengeful spears, each strike accompanied by thunder's roar. A discordant symphony of terror that echoed through the valley, drowning hope in the cacophony of dread. But amidst the cataclysm, the town clung to the memory of the family that had vanished. Their father had been cast into the pit of their disdain, yet the mother and children were cherished threads woven into the fabric of their hearts. So, despite the tempest's fury, groups of determined men ventured into the forest's sinister embrace, risking life and limb to find the innocent souls ensnared by madness. The storm eventually relinquished its grip, the rivers receded and the clouds dissipated, leaving behind a landscape forever altered. But the woods had swallowed the family whole, leaving no trace, no whisper of their passage. The rain had cleansed the earth of their presence, as if nature itself had conspired to erase the horror that had happened. They've been swept away. Mourn the villagers in solemn unison, their voices a chorus of grief that echoed through the tavern and reverberated in every heart. They must be somewhere, others insisted, unable to abandon hope. And so they ventured into the woods, one step at a time, drawn into the abyss by a sense of justice that defied reason a feeling that would lead them to the horrors hidden within the heart of the trail. For nine days, they scored the woods surrounding the trail, finding nothing. But then, on the tenth, they stumbled upon something, something that would forever haunt their dreams. Deep within the trail's core, where once only dried leaves and mud existed, Something sinister had emerged, an immense slab of granite. 
However, this otherworldly monument wasn't the lone terror that awaited them. Atop the slab, arranged in a chilling triangle, rested three skulls, meticulously polished to a macabre sheen. Their hollow eye sockets gazed towards the center of the coffin-like stone, where an arcane symbol had been ruthlessly chiseled into existence. The village trembled in their mixture of revulsion and terror, the air heavy with muted prayers and hastily drawn crosses. The whisper of devilry crept through the populace like a phantom wind, the very notion of malevolent worship clawing at their minds. Even the staunchest skeptics, those who had dared to delve deeper into the mystery, found their convictions unraveling like brittle bones as they pressed forward along the cursed trail. Murmurs spoke of a malignant presence, lurking just beyond sight, concealed within the shroud of shadows within the trail. The rumor soon solidified. Within the trail's depths dwelled the beheaded family, forever trapped in a grotesque purgatory. Their ghostly cries transformed into nightmarish hisses a spectral chorus yearning for release. Deprived of their heads, they sought the impossible, to weep without eyes, to scream without mouths. For those reading this, it might sound like just another tale, easily dismissed with skepticism, yet for us bound to this village, each word carries the burden of truth. An unsettling reality with acknowledgement, with held breath and ice-cold determination. Me, most of all. I arrived here as an outsider, uprooted from my old life during my tumultuous teenage years. It was my parents' job loss that drove this move, a change forced upon us. We had limited resources and this barren place was the best we could manage. A stark contrast from the hustle and bustle of city life. Amid the intricate social scene of the schoolyard, I never reached the heights of popularity, nor did I join the ranks of the odd, solitary kids who lingered in corners during breaks. I inhabited that mysterious middle ground, a twilight zone where faces merged and identities blurred within the crowd. It might sound discouraging to some, but it's a strangely reassuring state of limbo. Amidst the sea of faces, you're free from accusing fingers or prying stares. You simply blend in with the crowd, forming a genuine friendship or two. When I was suddenly thrust into this alternate reality, a wave of dread washed over my insecure teenage self. I was terrified that my self-perceived awkwardness wouldn't find a place to belong. I was about to become the new kid, burdened with the task of fitting in. My heart raced, armed with only a bit of charm and a hint of charisma that barely extended beyond the ordinary. Nights were filled with worries I might end up at the bottom rung of the social ladder wandering along through the desolate corridors of isolation. So, my days were tainted with worry with a swirling storm of fear inside me as I neared the inevitable encounter with my new peers, where I had to secure my place in their social order. However, life's strange twists caught me off guard. When I stepped through the school gates, a united stare fell upon me like a hungry horde, mouths gaping in surprise, eyes gleaming with curiosity. In an instant, my eager crowd gathered around, bombarding me with questions about my previous life and the stark contrast between my origins and this unfamiliar terrain. Their curiosity transformed into an unplanned coronation thrusting me into the upper tiers of popularity. My ego bathed in this newfound glory, and as the days unfurled, so did my arrogance. The sparkling tapestry of acknowledgement enveloped me, 
and I started to believe that I was truly exceptional. But as with all tales, a pivotal moment arrived. The mystery surrounding the new kid began the wane, gradually overshadowed by familiarity. I returned to the realm of the ordinary, though never the outcast I had dreaded becoming. This change wasn't the calamity my initial anxiety had painted. I found my niche, a tribe of friends, and a secure place within this complex microcosm. However, I was no longer the radiant comet blazing through their universe, and the flavor of that elevated existence had been intoxicating, and I was unwilling to let it go. In my pursuit of the unattainable, I set upon the road of reinvention, a path fraught with trails and challenges. The pinnacle of the social order was held by the jocks, an embodiment of adoration and jealousy. And so, I embarked on my athletic journey. Soccer was the sole sport in our village, yet its complexities remained a mystery to me. Still, driven by a misplaced confidence, I forged ahead, imagining myself basking in the pinnacle of admiration. Reality as ever laughed in the face of my fantasies. The ball rarely heeded my wishes, and my visions of fame faded. Instead of being a player, I found myself cast as more as a cheerleader, an ill-fitting role that rubbed against my aspirations. I quickly abandoned my athletic dreams, embracing a new persona, the tough guy, the rebel without a cause. It might seem cliche now, but back then, it held an irresistible allure. In those days, the silver screen shimmered with the allure of unyielding spirits and leather-clawed charm, a captivating blend that attracted the opposite sex and commanded respect from peers. For those who question my decisions, remember, it was a different time an era where somatic stories filled our dreams and shaped our aspirations. In the twilight of youth, I hadn't yet held the gap between somatic glamour and the harsh reality of life. I delved into the basics, and what does every rebel own? A weapon that transforms them into a creature of danger, unpredictable and captivating. I sifted through my dad's long-neglected possessions, my thoughts consumed by the ultimate goal. And there it lay, hidden amongst the mess, a switchblade knife, an artifact from a past he had once shared with me. Its handle, a rubberized grip adorned with camouflage, with a perfect fit for my intentions. Upon acquiring it, an unbreakable bond formed. The blade became an extension of my very self, my fingers entwined in its dance, more so while in the presence of the opposite sex. In one of my attempts to impress bystanders with elaborate maneuvers, I unintentionally carved into my own flesh. Yet I wore those wounds as badges of honor, thinking the red trails added a hint of rebellion and fascination. Understand, these were different times, a different mindset, so please, withhold judgment. However, a blade and an air of nonchalance weren't sufficient. The transformation demanded a complete appearance overhaul. Emulating action cinema protagonists and heavy metal idols, I let my hair grow wild and untamed. Vintage denim jeans, expertly aged, merged with a thrifted leather jacket teamed with my father's old military boots and a hefty iron chain encircling my waist, became my all-purpose armor, suitable for any scenario and weather. Looking back, it's quite amusing how my youthful enthusiasm shielded me from the sheer absurdity of it all. At that time, I wholeheartedly believed I embodied the epitome of wicked cool. However, Dressing the part and toying with the knife merely scratched the surface of my aspirations. I aimed to embody raw toughness, not the skill of a juggler. 
Thus, I committed acts that continue to haunt me. I transformed into a bully, targeting younger students and pestering the opposite sex in my quest for their attention. For a fleeting instant, my behavior granted me the sought-after notoriety, spurring me to escalate my distorted performance. I initiated pointless conflicts with anyone who would engage, smuggled alcohol into school, openly consuming it in the bustling cafeteria or the sunlit courtyard. Though I never truly became drunk, a lone beer accompanied me throughout the day. I just wore a facade of drunkenness, enacting it as a form of art. Unfortunately, all of this failed to satisfy my grand ambitions. So, in a climax only an overconfident fool could orchestrate, I jumped onto a cafeteria table during a midday recess and delivered my ultimate act of defiance. I declared my intent to conquer the trail. On May 10th, at the stroke of 4.30 in the afternoon, I stood alone at the threshold of the Forbidden Path observed by an array of indulged eyes lurking afar down the winding road. Two massive cork trees guarded the entrance, their gnarled branches intertwined like lovers in a macabre dance, creating an overhead canopy of sagging limbs that formed a tight-knit roof, choking out the light and plunging the path into an abyss-like darkness. It was a portal into the unknown, a black hole with a ferocious appetite for those daring or foolish enough to venture close. Inside my chest, a swarm of nerves buzzed, growing more insistent as I stared into the abyss. A cold breeze slithered out from the path, winding its icy tendrils around me. In any other circumstance, I would have welcomed such a breeze but this one carried an aura of malevolence that sent shivers down my spine. My trembling hand sought refuge into my jacket pocket, fingers clasping tightly around the switchblade. A feeble effort to cling to the shreds of my earlier confidence and arrogance, a defense against the instinct to flee from this ominous place. My gaze swept across the huddled crowd, their eyes wide with a blend of dread and anticipation. They lingered at a cautious distance, bound by fear, akin to sheep wary of strain too close to the predator's lair. A shared apprehension hung heavily in the air. Despite their evident cowardice, I knew that yielding at that moment would brand me as a coward for all time, which left me with no other choice but to press forward. I took a deep, shivering breath, then confronted the crowd with a confidence I lacked. I managed a strained smile, waving casually at them. A chorus of gasps and held breaths rippled through the onlookers. In the midst of the shocked faces, I caught glimmers of admiration, igniting a spark within me. This was the motivation I needed. Once more, my attention shifted to the gapping abyss, its darkness now less menacing than before. After confident thumbs up to the crowd, I finally propelled myself into the unknown. The trail's eternal twilight clashed starkly with the outside world, momentarily blinding me as my eyes adapted to this new reality. Regardless, I kept running. The trail began with a gentle ascent that swiftly drained the energy from my untrained body, forcing me to stop, panting and sweating, just after a few strides in. I took the early break to absorb the environment, to gauge the accursed path and all its unsettling grandeur. It was exactly what one would expect it to be, a woodland trail dimly lit, ensnared by a thick undergrowth that dared any intruder to stray from its path. It felt eerie, as such paths do when confronted alone. 
there was an unsettling sensation that clung to my skin, as if malevolence lurked within the shadows. Behind me, an abrupt crack shattered the silence, making my heart erupt within my chest, sending warmth coursing through my limbs. Immediately I swiveled, but saw nothing other than a carpet leafs. Branches often snap with the wind, I reminded myself, repeating this as a mantra to calm my racing heart. Still, more shaken than I'd like to admit, I resumed my journey, feeling my thighs heavy and a bit wobbly due to that initial sprint. I should exercise more, go for runs, I mumbled to myself, trying to pry my thoughts away from the persistent unease that gripped the back of my neck. Yet this ploy proved useless, as the sediment lingered on. There was an unsettling quiet pervaded the air, unnatural for a springtime woodland. No birds singing and not even the cicadas' relentless chorus. There was also a pervasive humidity in the air that stifled my breath and weighed down each step, reducing my pace to a snail's crawl. Every time I stopped to catch a breath, an eerie silence enveloped me, as the rhythmic crunch of leaves under my feet coming to a halt. This silence carried a suffocating weight, amplifying my anxiety with its deafening presence. I will finish this, I spoke aloud, hoping to lull my fraying nerves. It wasn't wholly effective but it stirred enough strength for me to trudge on. Yet, as I progress further into the trail, the sensation of being watched grew more and more intense. The shadows of the forest appeared to merge with a sinister intent, and the ground emitted cracks more frequently now, distinctively closer to me. Still, I pressed on reminding myself that these woods were inhabited by rabbits, squirrels, even boars or deer, any of which capable of causing the sounds I heard. The air grew intensely stale, enveloping me in a shroud that left my skin clammy. The oppressive humidity seemed to warp what should have been a refreshing cold breeze into something akin to putrid breath. This further hindered my pace, causing each step to feel burdensome, while my mind battled the chilling silence that felt far from natural. This is all in my head. It's just the stories resurfacing from my memories, I muttered, trying to find encouragement in my lackluster rationalizations. Adding to my unease, the trail began to morph. Its width constricted, while the proliferation of twists and turns emerged, with disorientation setting in quickly, leaving me completely unsure of my heading. The underbrush clawed at my shoulders in a relentless assault that often snared my jacket, prompting the occasional yelp as my mind raced, conjuring spectral hands reaching out from the foliage. Thoughts of quitting frequently crossed my mind, Yet the dread of retracing my steps was even more potent than the urge to flee. Thus, in this suffocating corridor, I forced my legs to continue. Step by reluctant step, until the inevitable end of the trail, with the occasional rogue tear streaking across my face in response to the overwhelming tension. This physical and mental exertion combined caused me to sweat profusely my long hair becoming so drenched that sweat streams would fly through my brow, stinging sharply and reducing my sight to fragments. The snap of breaking twigs intensified, their crackle growing louder and more frequent, as though the lurking entity within these woods was edging closer. It reached a point where it felt as if whatever it was out there was purposefully chasing me, the instinct to sprint, to flee from the malevolent force that I had grown convinced was tailing me, surging within me. But my wary body refused to heed. Instead, 
I was forced to halt repeatedly, gasping for breath, or to peer back at what lay behind, seeing only an impenetrable thicket that offered no answers. During one such pause, a gust of wind, wild and unpredictable, gathered fallen leaves and ensnarled me into a vortex, robbing me of sight. Amidst this chaotic swirl, a faint crack resonated, a footfall approaching. Panic surged, an electric charge that jolted my hand to my jacket pocket, retrieving my loyal companion. In a frenzy, I flung my arms wide, cleaving the air in a desperate defense. But my trembling anxiety had made my grip slippery. And so, in that frantic moment, the blade slipped from my grasp, soaring into the inky abyss of the forest. Feeling now utterly defenseless, a fresh wave of panic crashed over me, making me plummet to my knees. Fist met earth in an outpouring of despair, each impact a cry of futility. Time halted its march, plunging me into a void where the cold grip of terror held dominion. My chest constricted. The frantic beat of my heart sounded the alarm of impending doom. A hiss, spectral and sinister, slithered from the shadows beyond. It mirrored the sound of a dying gasp, stifled and unfulfilled. What's there? I bellowed, each syllable a tortured exhalation. Instinct begged me to confront this phantom, but my body defied reason, frozen by a dread beyond understanding. Another crack, even closer, ruptured the air, sending a stream of icy sweat tracing my spine and sending my flesh to quiver like the wind-stirred leaves. Closing my eyes, enveloping myself in darkness, I offered a desperate prayer to any entity willing to listen, begging them to banish whatever presence was drawing near to claim me. But just as I finished that last prayer, every fiber of my being turned to ice, even the rebellious twitch in my restless fingers. A damp breath had just brushed against my ears. Please. The whispered plea escaped me, a tremulous invocation to some unseen mercy. Then, a touch. A frigid palm settled between my shoulder blades. Please. I begged once more, tears streaming down my cheeks like a torrent. Another hiss came this time an exhalation that brushed my left ear, followed by a push, delivered with otherworldly force. A primal terror surged, overpowering all reason, propelled me forward. I fled, leaving behind everything but the need to escape, the pain in my chest and knees a distant memory. I sprinted through the narrow, sinuous path until my body could carry on no more collapsing and throwing my feeble form onto the forest floor. Fortunately, the carpet of dried leaves cushioned my fall, sparing me more than a mere scrape. Though my body remained physically intact, my mind laid in ruins with fragmented thoughts swirling through my head in a furious tempest. This can't be real. My words echoed through the trees as I knelt trembling as if stricken by a lightning bolt. None of this can be real. Although the instinct to stay curled in a ball, waiting for whatever was out there to come, was strong, I knew I couldn't remain passive. I had to keep moving. So, despite the protests from my exhausted body, I forced myself to stand back up, using the threat of what lurked behind me as my motivation. So, I awoke my sore muscles and forced myself forward, deeper into the path. I hadn't ventured far before I confronted the blockade of fallen trees obstructing the trail. Staring at it, I couldn't shake the feeling that the forest itself was conspiring against me. I muttered curses into the air, and as the words escaped, 
I sensed something moving through the air behind me. A faint rustling of leaves that, in my ears, took on an unsettling semblance of an amused chuckle. Irrational, I know, but still. I twisted my neck, as though expecting a malevolent presence to leer from behind, savoring in my predicament. Thankfully, behind me was only an empty void, but I wasn't deceived by it. Within that void lurked something, something that held me in its grip, preventing any notion of retreat and urging me to press onward. I returned my attention to the chaotic labyrinth of decaying branches stretching before me, their skeletal fingers protruding in every direction, as if poised to seize and confine me in an eternal grasp. How am I supposed to get through that? I pondered while drawing nearer to the gnarled mess, my eyes scanning for an entry point. The notion of circumventing it crossed my mind, yet the idea of straying from the path into those desolate woods twisted my stomach with a force revealing the thought of retreating. After squinting at the contorted chaos for a while, I found a way through. A tad tight for comfort, but a passage nonetheless. Entering the labyrinth thicket had been easy, but escaping it? That was a different tale altogether. Every step felt like a relentless trial, carried out with painstaking slowness due to the gnarled maze of twigs and branches that provided scant space for maneuvering. As pressed on, with my body constantly wedged against decaying wood, had it not been for the protection of my denim and leather armor, I was certain that emerging from this ordeal with my skin still attached to my body would have been impossible. And if that wasn't harrowing enough, those bothersome finger-like branches were forever reaching out, yanking my hair, making me howl like a wounded dog. I swear to you, if I had had my knife back then, I would have used it to sever my glorious mane, anything to break free from that relentless torture. After what felt like hours of torture, I emerged from the branches into the open expanse of the trail. I was pleasantly surprised to find that the trail ahead had widened, alleviating the need to continuously brush against the thicket. No longer did I have to fear that something might leap out and drag me into its depths. The twists and turns had seemingly vanished too replaced by a continuous straight line that granted me a clear view of what lay ahead. This eased my restless heart, which no longer had to dread concealed daggers lurking around corners. And there was more good news. At the end of this stretch, a light awaited. An exit, perhaps? I wondered, feeling my steps quicken with renewed vigor. As had become the norm since I embarked on this journey, my hope, however, was short-lived. As I drew closer to the light, the truth became evident. It wasn't an exit, but rather a small clearing as my eyes discerned its contents. The flicker of optimism and hope within me was swiftly consumed by dread. We had all heard the tale. And while most people subscribed to its beliefs, I had always harbored skepticism about its darkest elements. Yet now, I was to face them head on. Basking in the sunlight lay one of the trail's most profound enigmas, the immense granite slab. A tremor coursed through me, my heartbeat pounding in frenzied rhythm with my thoughts. Beads of sweat sprang forth from my brow, tracing a treacherous path across my face, stinging my eyes that I staunchly refused to close. I simply couldn't tear my eyes away from that eerie stone. Its gruesome history replayed in my mind, conjuring macabre imagery of blood-soaked skulls resting atop it. The warm glow of candlelight illuminating this eerie scene casting dancing shadows of headless bodies kneeling in silent prayer, as if awaiting my approach. I was paralyzed by fear, 
unable to move even an inch. This forsaken path, as always, refused to release its grip on me. It was unwilling to let me remain still, to stall, even for a second, my progression into its depths. And as it happened before, a sudden gust of wind materialized seemingly from nowhere, carrying an unsettling unease that held a strangely familiar touch. But it wasn't solely the wind. With it came an ominous crescendo of breaking twigs, coupled with the sinister hiss of a throat struggling to breathe. This time I hesitated not. I fled with the desperation of a cornered animal, sprinting towards the grim altar that loomed ahead. I feared whatever was chasing me more than the horrors that lied ahead. I refused to look back, unwilling to glimpse what emerged from the shadows, pursuing me with that sinister hiss. Fueled only by terror, I hurried onward, each agonizing step a testament to my will. But the limits of my endurance closed in swiftly, my body betraying my desperate ambition. My knees buckled, agony rippled through my frame, turning limbs to green vines. Yet I pressed, the sheer force of terror overriding the boundaries of pain. My chest ignited, breath short and agonized, as my sprint persisted. Vision blurred, the landscape a dizzying whirl, but I forced myself, refusing to give up. And then, I emerged, clawing my way out of the abyss into the embrace of light. Clarity assaulted my senses, a blinding release from the murk, but victory was fleeting as my strength surrendered and I plummeted like a discarded puppet. My skull pulsed with a sharp agony, a tolling bell within my head that summoned disorientation. Struggling, I raised my gaze, surveying the world in a haze, seeking bearings. The ringing persisted like a spectral choir disrupting my thoughts. My eyes grew heavy and weakness took a hold of my body as I fought to uphold consciousness. I won't black out, I declared to myself, each word a desperate plea. I won't. But the darkness encroached, with my grip on consciousness slipping into oblivion. The frigid breath of the air brushed against my face, eliciting a shiver down my spine that snapped my eyes awake. A veil of haze enshrouded my thoughts. A misty barrier cradled the memories of whatever horrors had transpired just beyond my reach, as elusive as a wisp of smoke. Enveloped in confusion, I fumbled my way around, my fingers encountering the icy touch of bare stone beneath my head. Memories start shimmering in, though still unclear, like distant stars through the fog. At the back of my mind was a voice, a whisper beckoning me to stand and escape, and so I forced my body upright. But as soon as I did so, a searing pain shot through my scalp, as if my hair was being violently torn from my scalp, bringing tears to my eyes and contorting my face in a grimace. The sudden pain dispelled the haze in my mind, returning memories that unveiled the stark reality of my predicament. I blacked out. I murmured under my breath, followed by a curse born from the realization of the colossal mess I had unwittingly entered. The sun had already set. I must have been out for a couple of hours, I realized. Alone and vulnerable, the thought sending a shiver throughout my body. My heart and neck throbbed from the fall, and I sensed a dry crust at my right temple. All I wanted was to curl into a ball and await morning's arrival to complete the trail. Yet the mere notion of lingering in the dark was agonizing enough to propel me past the pain and the impending discomfort of traversing the shadowy woods. Squinting my eyes, I surveyed my surroundings, my stomach plummeting to the depths of the earth as soon as I realized what was there with me. 
At the far end of the cold slab knelt three figures, their heads grotesquely absent and their posture frozen in a macabre imitation of prayer. The center figure, a large form unmistakably female, clawed in a nightgown, accompanied by two children on either side, their forms swathed in simple pajamas. Their skin was parched and ashen, resembling bananas left too long under the merciless sun. Due to their heads having been cruelly severed, above their shoulders were grotesque stumps. The sight of them feeling not only wrong but also profane. Bile surged up my throat, flooding my mouth with its acidic taste before I expelled it onto the ground below. My stomach cramped, wanting to expel more of the vial, but there was nothing else in it. This can't be real. I'm going mad. I muttered while on all fours, eyes fixed on the blanket of leaves beneath me. It appears you fail to appreciate my pets. A raspy voice, rough as the bark of ancient trees, murmured from behind. I recoiled. A primal instinct propelled me away from the source of that dread-infused voice. My lips tingled, numbness creeping forth as my heart hammered against my ribs. I didn't retreat far, for a frigid grip clamped onto my ankles, yanking me back with crazy force. Patience is a virtue we've long cultivated for the company of visitors like you. The voice dripped with malice like of a predator savoring its catch. You shan't depart so swiftly, not when you're the answer to our long-awaited yearning. Damn you to hell, I retorted, a feeble act of defiance that only seemed to amuse the unseen tormentor. Its laughter echoed in the abyss, akin to leaves crushing beneath a relentless footfall. Repeat what you've just said closer to me, the voice commanded, a directive that sent me burrowing deeper into the soil, as though seeking refuge within the very earth itself. An irate growl shattered the silence, and to my terror, the maternal figure surged forward, her fingers like vices gripping my shoulders, twisting my body around as effortlessly as a page flipped in a malevolent tome. Her offspring joined the sinister choreography, pinning me with nightmarish strength, compelling me to gaze upon the heavens. My eyes darted frantically, averting the nightmare incarnate before me. The sight was unbearable, too grotesque for the mind to fathom. Time has been running for a long time, so please pardon our manners or their absence. The gravely voice resounded, its tone oddly courteous in this unholy theater. I fear our patience, though well cultivated, after this long as waned. It added a touch of melancholy seeping through its harshness, as if mourning a connection severed by eons. Let me go, I implored, desperation gnawing at the edges of my voice. Yet the father, lurking in obscurity, laughed, a sound like autumn's dying breath. Ah, but why would I let you simply stroll away? You're the interloper here. This land belongs to me, not you. Every action has its reckoning, wouldn't you say so? The voice intoned somberly, the weight of ages carried in its chilling words. My intentions were never to incline this nightmare, yet I suppose it's my own failure at taking a closer heed to what was entailed within that contract. The voice mused, the words drifting as if carried by a haunting breeze. For countless years, I've struck bargains with him. They always unfolded in my favor. Perhaps hubris got the better of me. Complacency eroded my caution. You see, dealing with him requires a meticulousness beyond measure. Each word within the bargain must be weighed, 
for he is the creature of malevolence. His delight lies not in the mere closing of the pact, but in the ensuing agony it brings. The voice rumbled with a growing contempt. These poor souls were fortunate, the father said, his tone gesturing towards the headless figures that imprisoned me. These spirits have long departed this realm, leaving only the decaying husk animated by my will. The voice said, each word delivered with a dry cadence that chilled my bones. What? What are you going to do to me? I asked, as the father finally ended its speech. A cruel smile, invisible yet palpable, accompanied the voice's response, sealing my fate with its chilling words. That, my unfortunate friend, hinges entirely on you. Two choices lie before you. Stay or depart. Then let me leave. I choose to go. I implored. A surge of adrenaline lending my limbs a fleeting strength as I strained against the bonds that held me fast. Yet their grip remained unyielding, their strength an insane force. Not so swiftly, my friend. Departure can indeed be yours, but not without terms. The father's voice resonated with a mounting excitement, a predatory thrill coursing through his words. You see, you are now inextricably mine, he continued, forming a gesture towards the dark stain upon the stone slab, my blood mingling with the stone highlighting a tainted symbol. What do you want? I roared, desperation clawing at my voice, as the wellspring of despair within me threatened to drown all reason. What I want, bellowed the entity, his voice a serrated edge tearing through the air, thrusting himself forward until his face loomed inches from mine. It bore the same desiccated hue as the rest of his kin, yet his eyes blazed with an eerie vitality. I recoiled, shifting my gaze, but the matriarch's bony grasp seized my skull, directing my unwilling attention back to him. The exhalation of his breath rasping like serpents, a sulfurous exhalation that gnawed at my senses, threatening to choke me. I wish the same as you, he murmured, his lips a mere hair's breadth from my own to escape from this wretched place. A gulp clawed its way down my throat, a gnarled knot of ascent lodging there as his words wrapped around their tendrils around my neck. And in that moment of affirmation, he melted back into the inky embrace of the shadow like a wreath slinging through its cracks of reality. Today you shall flee from here and sire a son. His words oozed forth, deliberate and laden with ominous intent. When the fruit is born, you will deliver him unto me without hesitation. The father's pace was deliberate, each word a calculated incantation, while the mother's vice-like grip constricted around my skull, a silent force amplifying the compulsion. Do we have an agreement? I stepped out of that gnarled trail that night, shrouded in shadows cast by nine trees. Come morning, I was hailed as a living embodiment of courage, a paragon of audacity, but I wore no badge of valor on my chest. The veneer of bravado clung like cobwebs while my thoughts skulked in the corner of unease. All I craved was to be alone to escape the relentless questions from my peers. Their probing queries, seemingly innocent in their intent, wove a sinister tapestry in my mind, unearthing unfathomable terrors that brought me to tears, in surges no different from the wails of a newborn. Soon enough, I found myself deserted, 
cast aside like a soiled rag, unfit for the tapestry of companionship. It was a cruel twist to my harrowing journey. High school ebbed away, then college, with the relentless flow of time carrying away the memory of that fateful night. Gradually, my psyche knit itself back together weaving a semblance of normality from the frayed strands of my sanity. And so, like a dream forgotten with the morning light, the nightmare receded into obscurity. But as they say, not all that is forgotten is lost. One day, a peculiar object appeared atop my kitchen's granite countertop, an artifact from the abyss of forgotten horrors, an aged switchblade knife, weathered by the capricious nature of the elements, its camouflaged handle, a sinister signature that unmistakably confirmed its identity. I scuffed, my initial reaction one of disbelief, assuming this was just some twisted joke. With a hasty hand, I moved the casted out the window back to where it belonged, the oblivion. But mid-throw, I froze my actions interrupted by a buzz, a resonance originating from the phone nestled in my back pocket. I answered, and in the same heartbeat, my ears were inundated by my wife's ecstatic cries. You're gonna be a daddy, she cried out. The words an electrifying surge that plunged me into a new reality, one that intertwined past horrors with a present I thought I had securely fastened to a safe distance.